Good evening, I'm Mahish Johnny in Colombo. This is a special report on the current economic crisis Sri Lanka is undergoing at this moment. We want to bring you expertise advice, give an understanding as to what's going on and to make sure that we cut through the noise and nonsense that's out there. Now, this current government that has always taken a nationalistic economic approach had to change its tune due to the pressures of the current crisis. From the onset of this pandemic, Sri Lankan leaders were of the view that we will weather it by banking on bilateral relations and very much banking on the support uh, provided by friendly nations like India, China and Russia. IMF at that point was an option they rejected flat out, but very much was floated by liberal economists and think tanks in Sri Lanka, despite its enormous long-term repercussions. Right now, the situation at hand has dictated the term and here we are on our knees, biting the bullet and taking our best shot with the IMF. Uh, joining me now to discuss more on this is Senior Lecturer at the Department of Economics at the University of Colombo, uh, Mr. Indrajit Aponsu. Good to see you, sir. Thank you very much for joining. Um, well, here we are, a uh, tough time for Sri Lanka. Go undergoing a, a severe economic uh, uh, crisis which has not just COVID being the responsible uh, factor, but it is a cascading event. I mean, if you want to blame, we can blame 73 years of, uh, uh, um, you know, not progressive type of economic uh, approach. Now, here we are at the end, tail end of things, and uh, we're going through a, a massive crisis. Um, IMF seems to be the idea that everybody uh, is floating, saying that this is our solution, this is where we have to go. Going to IMF is going to solve all our problems. Uh, what exactly is your viewpoint on this? And what do you think about the current crisis, where we are? Well, what we are at the moment facing is, uh, well, it's been a pleasure to be in this program, first of <laughs> all, Mahesh. Uh, what I can say is that there's a lot of noise being uh, sort of being made around. And uh, in fact, you're, you're opening, uh, you said that we are on our knees. I think that's one way of looking at the whole issue. <coughs> Countries do go through a lot of crises in different different times, and they make decisions. So it's not just one decision, but there are so many decisions you know, that are available on your table, and you try to make the best out of the decisions that are there. Now, sometimes you get into situations where your options are, are very limited. I think you know, what we are in at the moment is we are in a situation where we have basically have very limited uh, limited uh, options available and as a result <coughs> we have sort of taken a sort of seemingly a somersault from where we were one time to say that we are not going to the IMF but here we are right so the question is is it a political thing mm. to me it's not a political thing these are how businesses work as well but of course you know there is an overhype there is an hype where on the on either side to say that we don't go to IMF we basically you know politicizing the whole thing then the other side of it is no you got to go to the IMF and it's the only way and then you, you it's so arrogance and all that I think when it comes to economic rationality you rationalize the best options you have so in that each option has its pluses and minuses. So IMF is no exception. The question why the present government did not want to go to the IMF uh, was not without reasons. There are reasons, many, many reasons. I would take you back to the last seven years, so from 2014 onwards to 2020, 2019. <coughs> So that there is an in-between period of 2020 and 2021 where there's a lot of uncertainties going around. Let's leave that out for a minute. So up to 2019, we were basically just a normal economy, yeah. right? And we never had many crises either. The global system was very much favorable. Oil was, oil was very much on a, a, a song. So, but then we also had a serious aberration there. Something was not right. We went to IMF, not without, without a crisis, we went to IMF. That's we, during the 2015 period. 2015 period. And so we got the advice, we got the assistance, but something did not click. 
So this IMF being the silver bullet seemed to have not delivered for whatever the reasons. During a uh, uh, normal time. Normal time. <coughs> so, so in that context, one need to be very uh, uh, careful as to how you assess this situation. Is it the political kind of uh, uh, talk that you should have, or is it something much more rational, much more facts-based? Now, if I just take you back to the last particular period, we had one of the worst scenarios of all the account, except one account. We have a balance of payment, or a trade balance, <coughs> which was getting into 10.5 billion in 2018 before it recovered to about seven and a half billion in 2019. Now, as I see, that's where our problem is. Our crux of the problem is this trade balance. Let me just explain you what is this trade balance. Trade balance is the country's income and expenditure with the rest of the world. Now, everything else revolves around this one in a globalized situation. <coughs> People talk of budget deficit. People talk of various other things. These are a bit nonsensical. Of course, they are relevant, but they are not the most important issue that we have at hand. So our major challenge is how do we fix this trade balance deficit? If you just take a cumulative figure from 2014 to 2019, we come, our, our total trade balance deficit works out to something like $45 billion. Now, what it means is this, we have spent a lot, $45 billion in excess of what we have earned. Now, how on earth do you survive in a situation mm. like that? Of course, we were at least had the uh, nerve to accept the poor people's money, which has been coming at $6.5 billion in the last round, <coughs> which compensated part of the, our extravagance. But that's not the way to go. Yeah. go for a country. What we have to fix was trade balance. Now this is where I find a major calamity here. The, uh, with the IMF, we didn't focus on the trade balance. We focused on the budget balance. And we killed the growth. We escal uh, increased the VAT in order to have a balanced mm -hmm. budget. Mm -hmm. But if that was the solution, why did mm -hmm. we get why results which are totally contradictory to what is expected. Yesterday we had a similar uh, conversation uh, with uh, one of the heads of the banks here in Sri Lanka and what he said was right now in order to get some cash injected into our system because we are running out of cash. That's the truth. So in order to do that we need to actually show some kind of a confidence to the rest of the world. Any, any, any kind of investor who wants to come into Sri Lanka showcase to them saying hey we are going to get some books in order we are going to pull up our pants and we are going to pretty much dress up and going to the imf is going to give that confidence to the rest of the world uh, is that the case well that is right I and mean, that's what we are in at the moment i would put the blame on this government as well at the same time <coughs> having got the principle right they didn't strategize it right. Yeah. We should have anticipated, at least we should have had a cushion to think, look, these things are going to happen. And if that is the case, what do we do? What's our fallback position? What is our second best scenarios? I don't think we have thought about mm -hmm. that. We did push the exports, but I don't think we have pushed enough. There was also a conversation which says that around in 2020 when we knew that there is a global pandemic raging on in the world we, we, we could have like capped our un, un, uh, unnecessary imports at that particular point and also given uh, the rupee some kind of a, a value that is realistic to the markets but none of those actions were taken because we were more, oral, or more or less talking about the freedoms of our people and, and the ability that they should not, they should have everything. That, that 
was the thing and here we are uh, at this moment. Let me uh, get back into this entire conversation where the most of these liberal um, IMF uh, loving <laughs> think tanks in Sri Lanka, not even abroad, it has a unison voice. You take the opposition, you take these think tanks, you take all these pundits, <coughs> they claim to be economic experts. All these people are saying the moment you go to the IMF, problem solved. Everything's going to be okay. But we all know right now in order to to be at a comfortable, uh, at least not even a comfortable place, a, even a very low, lower place where we actually uh, want to keep our economy running, we need around four to five billion dollars to be injected into our economy right now. But IMF is not going to give us four to five billion whatsoever. The best we, will, we can do is around 1.5 billion. Uh, that is the conversation uh, that is happening right now. Even Mr. Uh, Basil Rajapaksa goes and pleads, fall on his knees and do everything. We will only get around 1.5 billion. That is also very questionable. Where are we going to get the rest? Because that rest, where is it going to come from? <laughs> Well, first of all, <coughs> IMF won't give you 1.5 billion straight away. <laughs> it will come in tranches. Yeah. So they will say, okay, we'll give you an initial amount, but then do show us that you comply with what we have told you. <coughs> right? So now I'll, I'll take you back to this, because the thing is the economics is not something where you just talk, people say, look, history is history. We have to think of today. Look, today is what we have done in the history. Today is not what we have done today. And you're going to face that situation a few years down the road again. Now, what is happening now? What is happening now is, you know, fuel crisis, uh, uh, queues. We are going to face the problem one year down the road because we, our growth is going to get hammered. How? Because people are not producing. Everybody is stranded on the road. So when the growth is getting hammered, then what happens is you are going to the, uh, another scenario. You see, we have basically t t exhausted all the cushions we had. I, I need to take this point once again to this way. <coughs> right. Now, this is where I have a problem, but at the same time I see some hope with the IMF. The hope with the IMF is this one. We just can't run a country like this. You can't live for the next hour. You can't live for the next shipment of oil. And then you off your cookers, off your everything. You can't do that. That's absolutely bad for any situation where you have a flow. It's not a discrete thing. Now, you don't do things at particular points of time. It's, it's a continuum. The minute you disturb that, it's like this. If you don't have a sleep, so it's going to have a hangover for the next two or three years until it has been sorted out. So this is exactly what we are going through here as well. Now, my point is this. When we come to the last regime time, when the IMF came, since That's, that is very important uh, for people to know. It's not as if IMF was not here. They were yeah. here in the very recent past. Yeah. Because the, the, uh, this idea of we have never gone to the IMF in the recent past or in recent economic conditions is what most of these think tanks are floating around. But we were there 2015, 2019, that particular period, which was just three years away. Um, uh, we were there and they were here. Let me tell you, I mean, I, I need to sort of be a little more specific here. <coughs> when the IMF came, what it did to us was we were given more opportunities for credit cards. Okay? So IMF coming here gave us more indulgence. We, we hammered the trade deficit to 10.5 billion. We hammered ISPs, 12 and a half billion. How did you get 12 and a half billion IM, uh, uh, ISBs, international sovereign bonds? Because IMF stood with us. And so they said, all oh, right, okay, we can give you guys. So we got cash. And we didn't have the necessity to fix the problem. We let the problem pass. My fear, if we get into the same mindset now. We are already there. Well, let me put it in this way. Still, you can manage it. 
You stand with the IMF, <coughs> let the IMF uh, uh, support you, give some breathing space, oxygen. At the moment, we are running short of oxygen. Everybody is gasped before. But, uh, but, yeah. but this conversation with the IMF is not going to give us that immediate oxygen we need because this conversation is also going to take another five, six, seven months down the line. Uh, how, how, how is that a solution? No, that's, that's, no, these are again the other issues. Uh, people, people talk off the cuff. <coughs> people say restructure debt. Yeah, and some yeah, people even yeah. say default debt. Yeah. I, I, I think in a lot of economists don't understand what they're talking. And we are, we, are de we are disconnected from the real world. We are blackboard guys. We have textbooks which says, if you do this, do this. If exactly, it happens, do this. 100% But true. go to a financial market guy. He works in an entirely different way. Mm. Actually, what we are at the moment facing is not an economic problem, financial problem. We have a shortfall of cash, dollar cash, right? If the IMF comes, what will happen is at least on the overall scenario, overall uh, global scenario, they'll say, okay, now this guy has got some support, right? There must be some relaxation, some kind of uh, openings to have some cash there. But what this government did in the past, although it was uh, insufficient, was that they were able to get some immediate funding because bilateral funding is the yeah. fastest way of getting things out. Okay? So, but the thing is, why, then what, what, what went wrong? What went wrong was this. In 2021, we have the highest imports bill. How come that? How did that happen? We didn't import cars. We didn't import, you know, cars is a fairly substantial amount of, mm. uh, uh, and <coughs> we probably did not go to the same kind of oil imports as well. Yeah. Right? Now, how did that happen? Now, that is where the problem is, you know, when you don't have a strategy where you have th not thought through properly how it operates, then you get into serious shocks. Now, let me take the exchange rate matter as well. Uh, before that, uh, yeah. I, I want to take a short commercial break yeah. because there's a lot to talk about the exchange rate itself and I want to give the, the due diligence of uh, uh, taking the time and actually explaining it. You're watching our special report on the current economic crisis. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone to the special report right here on Other Than 24 about Sri Lanka's current economic crisis. Uh, I'm in conversation now with uh, Mr. Indrajit Apansu, Senior Lecturer at the Department of Economics at the University of Colombo. Uh, we've been talking about the current situation and why we are here and what needs to be done. We a lot more to discuss about that particular element. Uh, Mr. Apansu, one of the things that catalyzes this whole uh, uh, matter. Even yesterday, I raised the same question uh, from the head of uh, uh, a private bank here in Sri Lanka. Um, was the forex market? Um, we uh, earlier on uh, the reserves was a problem. It was dipping, dr you know, dangerously low. There was no way of replenishing it because the replenishing avenues like tourism, uh, foreign remittances were dried down to zero. It came down to zero. That was the level it, 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 we lost it. And in order to support the level what we lost, we did not have any avenue in order to put um, uh, anything back into that uh, uh, pouch. So here we are in this drastic situation where everybody is saying we should have done more in order to keep our reserves up and running. And uh, even um, organizations like uh, Verite Research, one of ultra-liberal thinking uh, economic uh, uh, organizations here in Sri Lanka, and they are the ones who's vouching for everybody to go to the IMF because I know um, when you look at those people that they have never lived through anything because it's kids per se. But that's a different matter. But what I want to ask is um, what they say usually is, uh, hey, look at Bangladesh, look at India, look at Pakistan, all these countries around us, they've done very well. Their reserves are right up there. And here we are dipping to the, I think they had a, a graph also, <coughs> which they pretty much predicted and said, this is the reason 
reserves were not, uh, you know, it's not here. And then in order to support that, we had to come up with uh, uh, letting the rupee float and all, all those cascading events occurred. It impacted the fuel price. It's impacting every price structure in Sri Lanka right now. Um, here we are, reserves. Was that the problem? And what exactly do you think of their argument? Well, I happen to listen to a, a recast of what Veritas has said. I was quite appalled by the conversation, the connections, the so-called arguments about reserves. I mean, I think, you know, there are people, are, people are trying to create this narrative, reserves is something sacred. Mm. You have to have the highest. You have to rate. have to high. high. Mm. You see, reserves is like your water tank at home. There's an input, there's an output. All what you need to do is, even if you're at a low level of reserves, if you maintain it, mm. then you're okay. Then you're okay. But the point is this. Since you don't have the control over inflows and outflows, you always try to have a sizable reserve as a cushion against the, this variability. Mm. So this is where the reserves comes into play. Uh, it's not qu the question of, I have 7 billion reserves, 8 billion I'm reserves. Comfortable. Now, last government did have the reserves because you borrowed. So when you borrow, the cash comes in. And as long as the cash comes in, your reserves are high. But the minute you have to pay back a loan, which are especially the ISPs, you suddenly see your reserves dip massively. Now this is where the real challenge comes in. In the case of long-term borrowings, you always have this breathing space. What we made the fundamental mistake was we thought the monies that are coming from ISBs is just like the way we have been borrowing before. So what we did was we indulge in the uh, borrowings, but also at the same time we indulge in the lifestyle, which was the cause for the borrowings. Now the question is, where do we plug it? Now this government, when they came in, they said, okay, we take it very seriously. We know we can't go on like this, which is a very rational, mm. sensible decision. And it's a brave decision, because nobody wanted to do that. If you look at 2000 mm. to 2019, you can see the budget, uh, sorry, trade deficit from about one and a, just over one billion in 2000, just continuously to, falls to 10.5. 10 now, people don't see it as a problem. Why people don't see it as a problem? Because we are so much used to buying, importing things, not for production. Now you ask, what happened to Bangladesh? Hmm. What happened to, <coughs> the reason is this. If you look at our export portfolio, if you look at our production portfolio, we have very little manufacture. We have very little exportable manufacture. Bangladesh, is not a highly diversified country, but still they have managed to at least reap the benefits of garments in a much larger way. And, and, and nobody's talking about this particular fact. Their uh, political approach has been consistent for many, many years. They, they, they never change from, you know, <coughs> if they want to, uh, I think the, the garment industry itself has been an industry that has been uh, uh, flourishing for more than 20, 30 years. So it is a continuous, uh, argument we've been also making in this country saying we need to have consistency in our economic policy just because the government changed we can't scrap from zero and start from and that's exactly what we've been doing and uh, here the end result we don't have a proper income uh, to the outgoing of uh, uh, money uh, let's talk about the other aspect Can I make a small yes. point. Yeah. see I mean in that respect it's very important I see now <coughs> if you look at some of the imports up they're being curtailed now yeah say ceramics, tiles. Now ceramic tiles, there were two or three manufacturers in Sri Lanka and there were many tiles coming from other countries, say China, India and all, right? And the, if you talk to these people, they will tell you, look, we were running our stocks, something like eight months, nine months of tiles over the last, I mean, not the recent, before, right? So who will want to manufacture, will want to run stocks, eight months mm. of stocks 
you're not going to make a profit, yeah. right? Then what is happening when we open up the ceramics uh, imports, I was told, I didn't know about this one. I was told India, for example, there's a massive zone for ceramics manufacture. So they manufacture ceramics and they do it for exports, high value added exports. But in the process, they end up being second grade stuff. Now second grade stuff is from a financing point of view, zero cost. We have to throw it away. Yeah. Okay? You send it here at one third the price. Now how on earth a country yes. will do any manufacture if this is the way we go yeah, about it? Okay. You, you have to understand the global how the global that, system that, works. You see that, that that is embedded with our education, isn't it? Um, of the people's education. Now let's take for a simple example, <coughs> milk powder. Uh, milk powder, we know we have around two or three companies internally going through hell and back in order to provide the best quality products in Sri Lanka. Fresh milk, Palavatta milk, Ambevela. Uh, all these products are absolutely doing well. Yes, they have a <coughs> problem in uh, giving uh, the product, uh, you know, meeting the production to the demand. But that is something that we, if we continuously help them, they can increase and they can uh, make sure that they uh, get a, a good sense for uh, a good uh, bang on the buck. But what do we do as soon as we? get the opportunity we get all these foreign brands which are coming in and we flood our money back away from this country and uh, i mean we are basically flourishing markets in new zealand we are flourishing markets in australia we are flourishing cows there and making sure that they're having a good time out of our money and in return our people think that's the best, whereas we already have the best. That mindset change has not occurred for donkey's years. I, I need to sh continue what I just, where I stopped. Now, I was talking to the same friend. He said, look, there's a gap now. Now our stocks, not even one month stocks are with us now. It's moving. Yeah. It's moving. But there is a market deficit. There's a huge demand because the imports are not there and the supply is missing. Okay, how do we ex uh, increase the supply? We have to make an investment. You know what he said? Our problem with that is, okay, we make an investment. Give us the guarantee five years of no imports. And even then, if you make an investment, it's not going to deliver goods. Mm -hmm. It might take about a year. Get the machinery. This all tailor-made machinery. You see, what we people don't understand, we are so used to, we teach economics, mm -hmm. we are so used to demand and supply mm -hmm. curve. We says if you change the price, the demand immediately changes. Absolute nonsense. nonsense right? Absolute nonsense. nonsense. Then it should reflect in the fuel queues right Th this now. Is, this is where we are making a fundamental error in reality and academics. And I must tell you, taking this country to this level, we are responsible. Of course. We are given <laughs> the course. wrong advice. Of course. And of we are course. so, we are so uh, 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 egoistic in our attitudes. That, that's, that, is, that is the argument that I have as well. Because what you're all saying, like, let's talk for, for, for this liberal I, uh, idea of uh, you know, going to the IMF and say, now this we've been doing for 16 times. 16 times Sri Lanka has gone to the IMF and IMF has given us programs after programs to fix our economy. Did not happen. So 16 times of examples occurring and here we are, bunch of idiots who have no clue as to what the hell they are talking about because they have never lived through that uh, 16 times. They, they don't know what happened in the 60s, the 50s or the 40s or whatever the time. And they read some book from some goon in some uh, donkey country and here we are, uh, they are coming up and saying, you apply this, apply this, apply this. They have no clue as to what's happening on the ground because if they are saying tomorrow if we are at the gates of the IMF and the IMF says yes come in problem solved that's not gonna happen that's that is, that is absolutely not gonna happen it's like this you see I think this IMF I mean being narrated in a way which is totally inappropriate yeah right from the pro camp and for the against camp 
I would think, <coughs> I said, let's just take you back to that India and Sri Lanka, uh, India and uh, what are they have been doing, was they have been pushing manufacture consistently. If you look at Sri Lanka's manufacture in exports, we have had about uh, 25 percent. Now we are now below 16 percent. And the lowest has been in the last five years. Ha have been the last five years. Right? I, I, have, I have some graphs. I mean, it's shocking where we are now at the moment. Now, the question is, I mean, I, I'd say, okay, let's not blame IMF. Yeah. Let's blame ourselves. Of course. Uh, because of course. the reason is, you go to IMF, we call AWW, Atawana Wana. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, then you accept what they tell you. I mean, you make your point, look, these are all human beings. You make your point, look, this is what we have. This is our position. I think the Sri Lankan government <coughs> should be negotiating, not compromising on the fundamentals of the economy. If that is the case, we are going back to 2015, 2019 exactly. era repeat. We know that taking that hand out is going to increase our taxes. That's, that's definitely a thing that they will demand and we may have to see it through. So again, then uh, the promises given by President Gotabe Rajapaksa himself, one of the key fundamental of his economic uh, policy to the country by when he came to power in 2019, um, well, that's going to slash uh, itself uh, if by any chance if that those kinds of uh, things being accepted. But that's a different conversation. Uh, let's take a short commercial break. I'm in conversation with a senior lecturer at the uh, Department of Economics uh, at the University of Colombo, Mr. Indrajit Tapon. So we've been talking about Sri Lanka's current economic crisis, and we need to talk about solutions. Stand by. We'll be right back. This is a special report on the 24 on Sri Lanka's economic crisis. I'm in conversation with uh, Mr. Indraji Tambo Aponsu, senior lecturer at the Department of Economics uh, in the University of Colombo. We've been talking about a lot of issues that uh, Sri Lanka is facing, and one of the solutions that's floated is the IMF, and, and, and we've been trying to give a, a different viewpoint to the, the narrative that is out there, uh, trying to get you to understand this is not going to fix the issue. Uh, there are other solutions, but it is being told to you that that is the only solution. But if by any chance we sit back and take an assessment of what's going on, there are plenty of other solutions we can uh, uh, bank on right now. Bilateral relations is something that we can be, be, be um, thinking seriously about right now. China is missing in this conversation. As you know, uh, in the previous times, if there is a disaster in Sri Lanka, even, even some kind of a landslide, China is here to help us. And you need to ask that question, why? Are they silent? Because that is very vital to this entire problem. China's silence says a lot. Uh, we need to understand that means we are going in a wrong path that we should not be uh, uh, going to. But then again, I'm not the politician, I'm not the leader of this country. Uh, those decisions will need to be made uh, on a political level. Uh, Mr. Aposun, so one of the things that uh, I want to get you, uh, uh, I also want to talk about solutions. Um, they say inflation is going to skyrocket. Uh, this month, I think the next month, we're looking at around 30% of inflation uh, uh, very easily. Um, and, and that is going to be felt by the people uh, very heavily. The blame game goes to the printing of money in order to support this, uh, uh, you know, support the cash flow in Sri Lanka to, to keep the economy running. What exactly is your uh, point of view in that? You know, IMF policies generally uh, goes back to what the U.S. has been pre preaching. I think it, it's, it's very important to understand what U.S. has been doing the last 10 years. What U.S. has been doing the last 10 years, go to Trump era, we may not like the mm. guy, but he's liked by Many yeah, 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 of who are in the periphery and who are being feeling neglected. Who are these people who are feeling neglected? The, the manufacturers. Americans. The manufacturers. The guys who are being in the manufacturing field. They are still remaining ardent supporters of Donald Trump. You might make okay. a comeback. So that means that is, so which is not what the IMF policies, 
policies have been. IMF is totally delineated from US's policies. But still, they are preaching it. So just, just look at that. It's, it's, it shows hypocrisy there. The second point is that <coughs> the so-called printing of money and, uh, and then inflation. This debate has been going on. Yeah. Now, the question is that is the only thing that everybody understands. That's why they keep on No, but it's simplify. All is simplify. You know, how, what do they do that? I mean, in our classes, this is how we I I explain it. In the class, so each one has some amount of money, and there's something uh, for bidding, yeah. right? And then you ask to, okay, bid. And then you bid. Now I give every 1,000 rupees. What happened to the bid price? Bid price just goes up. goes up. Money supply and prices are all connected. This is one side of argument. But this argument has lost ground mm. many, 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 many decades ago for the simple reason governments in practice don't practice it. It's not realistic. It's not realistic because the, the forces are very different now. Forces are very different now. So that, that, that's, I mean, that's the answer to But the irony is when you connect that to a real issue mm. and take the whole focus from the real issue to something fictitious like money printing. Which is in, uh, said in the is, book. This is, this is not only in the book. This is what a lot of guys have been preaching. In fact, the presentation where it they did, you, they take you to, oh, this is where we made the problem. But then I asked the simple question, OK, when the IMF came during the last regime, it was a fix our economy. It was to create economic growth. It was to fix our trade balance. What did we fix? We fixed the primary account in the budget, which is basically revenue minus expand mm -hmm. the current expenditure. Mm -hmm. And Texas he said, look, look, you see, we balanced the budget. So what? <laughs> what did you get out of it? Did it make yeah. a difference to people? True. No. I, I think, you know, the, the, the way to look at this is we ha there's a lot of crap going on. The disarguments are being basically manipulated, manufactured to serve a particular agenda. Now, that, that is very ironic. Yes, exactly, because it is very clear, isn't it, what song they want us to sing. And it seems to be like this government is falling into that particular trap. And pretty much, uh, um, I mean, if you take Mahindra Rajapaksa's uh, tenors to the two tenors, the 10 years that he was, he was all about Sri Lanka. He, he, he was, let's, let's grow everything here, let's get everything. Here. And he was utterly against selling any kind of national asset we had. And, and he kept on telling this story. Now here, we know that's not going to happen as soon as uh, uh, these kind of programs comes into the country. We will be looking at all these uh, uh, not money make, uh, not, I mean, uh, uh, loss making uh, institutions will have to be given, privatized and all that kinds of things that were not in par part and parcel of that economic theory is, is going to take place. Is, is that something that you are uh, uh, looking at or, or is this no, I, I, I'm completely off here. <laughs> yeah, I have to tell you, a lot, lot of politicians do a lot of talking. They don't mean it. National, national policies, patriotism, these are all, you know, things that serve your requirement. None of these things are necessary. You've got to get the basics right. Even previous Mahindra Rajpaksha regime, <coughs> I would think they did certain things right. They did certain things wrong. And that wrongs got further precipitated during the last regime in a massive way. What, what am I talking about? What am I talking about is when we come to debt situation, I mean, we started borrowing ISPs in 2009. And during that period, 2009 to 2014, we borrowed 5 billion. We should have been careful. This money has to be paid in the next round. This money has to be paid in the next round. So every investment that we make should have been made on the basis there's an investment return. If you can't pay that money back, you're getting into 
a major problem. That's exactly what happened in 1997 in Thailand. Mm -hmm. They borrowed money heavily from Indian, uh, sorry, not Indian, Japanese uh, uh, banks because Japanese are uh, washed with cash. Growth has plummeted, so they have a lot of cash. So they gave cash for a song, and these guys borrowed money. And they're short-term borrowing. What did they do with that money? They invested that money on domestic assets. It didn't generate dollars. See, the equation is different. You can't be putting cash on a road and expect to pay back that loan. If it is not generating. It's not. So therefore, there is a problem there. <coughs> We've lost emphasis. Because I mean, during Mahindra Rajapaksa regime, we had a certain e export growth. But the emphasis was very mediocre. Mm -hmm. We should have pushed it. I think we should have pushed the way we pushed it now. Then and we had the, we, then now we had the we, are, we have an opportunity right now. Now we now actually at least we have got it right. We have got it right, but we didn't manage it right. We should have expected. I mean, getting getting people to accept something that they have been used to for so many decades, import indulgence, is a hard ball. Millions of people who are used to this, changing that mindset requires a lot of strategies which we didn't do. In your opinion, what is the quickest way, the shortest way, and the correct way we can get out of this? You mentioned about China. <coughs> I think you're right. We seem to be drifting away from China. It's not a wise thing. It's not a wise thing. We should be keeping our cards, playing our cards in a balanced way. But this is again politics. Is seemingly, if you're playing that politics, we're going to get hammered in the worst scenario if in, the, in the time to come. So I would think, well, going to IMF has become a necessity now. Because at least to accept the, the, the political opinions, mm -hmm. the pressure, <coughs> and to say that, look, OK, we are, we are doing our best in the current scenario to ease this pressure. There's a lot of pressure on people. Yes. Lot of pressure on people. Just today I had three power cuts. I couldn't do anything. I mean, I'm just trying to imagine how on earth somebody who is living on s basic things in the evenings, how do they survive? You can't do that. So that's something that has to be fixed immediately. Because uh, the, that is going to uh, translate into a massive social unrest, and which, uh, which, yeah. which is not exactly where this government wants no. to be uh, in. <coughs> or no, not only this government wants to be in. For if you want to in the, uh, focus on a uh, not so popular policy, you have to keep people informed. Yes. Keep them at yes. certain yes. certain uh, uh, loop with you, and that for that, this government should come out and say, look, we're going to cut our expenses 75%. This is something that I've been saying uh, quite often because the people <coughs> who are there to communicate policy to the real people, the person who's standing in the queue, the person who's going through uh, a fuel crisis or anything of that sort, now he does not understand where are our leaders, what are they doing, because it is very vital and it visually important that leaders are seen as people who are doing their level best because then people will try to understand or oh, if the people can say look here this is happening because of a b c d i'll be a rational individual i'll be a rational citizen and i'll say yeah i can't be you know, acting like an idiot like here let me uh, also do my part on on this and that is not happening power cuts are just happening fuel crisis is just happening so that communication error is absolutely vital not only communication I, error strategic era as well. I yes. mean, planning and, and also uh, uh, in, uh, you know, getting into situations where you try to manipulate the market, exchange rate thing, should have been handled in a way so yeah. that you, know, you should have anticipated. Yeah. Now see what has happened. I mean, you were in 200, now you're at 270. Yeah. Now see the cost escalations. It's going to upset the whole Apple card. Now on top of that, if, that, if the uh, informal market is still offering two, 290, yeah. So you are on a, another, another, yeah, exactly. na another, another, another scenario. True, indeed. Uh, we will be talking about this entire economic uh, issue all throughout the week. Uh, for, for now, I want to thank uh, Mr. Mr. Indrajit uh, Aponsu, the senior lecturer at the Department of Economics and, uh, of the University of Colombo. Very, very um, important, pertinent.
uh, points that you made, uh, Mr. Aponso, with regard to what we need to be thinking. We can't be getting into this bandwagon of, of, of liberal thinking, especially get advice. I heard uh, in another conversation uh, on an, uh, in another program on this channel itself that apparently uh, the finance minister was pretty much seeking advice from young economists who has never undergone any kind of crisis in their life. I don't think they, they I'm pretty sure their parents actually bought the underwear for them to wear on a daily basis. So people like that, and if the uh, finance minister is looking uh, for advice at the wrong place, obviously you will get the wrong advice and, and we will be in a bigger crisis. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ponso, for your time. You add, your add to the point. I think if you have common sense, <laughs> it's, <laughs> not, about individual. it's not about the individuals. That it's is about missing. <laughs> Clearly missing in Sri Lanka. Well, that's all the time we have for you tonight. I appreciate your company and we'll see you tomorrow at the same time as we bring you another side of the, this economic story. I'm Mahesh Johnny in Colombo. The news continues right here on Adhidharana 24.